The boy stood quietly in the corner of the temple, his forehead burning with the sting of pigment and prayer. Around him, grown men hummed low chants, their eyes closed, lost in trance. In this 9,000-year-old cave in Anatolia what we now call Turkey, someone, thousands of years ago, carved a human skull and painted it red. Why? Scientists still don't know. But buried in that ritual, in that moment, is the beginning of something almost impossible to understand. The awakening of the human brain. Not just as an organ, but as a force. One that would eventually shape gods, cities, science, and war. This isn't just about neurons and gray matter. This is a story of how the human brain became the most dangerous and miraculous object in the known universe. And it all began with a mystery so old, we can barely see its edges. Tens of thousands of years before those red skulls, something else was happening in the shadows of firelight. Deep in a cave in Spain, a Neanderthal took a chunk of ochre and drew lines on a wall. No animals, no hunting scenes, just abstract patterns. These markings, dated to over 64,000 years ago, are now believed to be the earliest known cave art. Here's the twist. This wasn't modern Homo sapiens. It was another species entirely. For decades, science told us Neanderthals were dull, simple-minded brutes. But what if they had language? What if they dreamed? This changes everything. It suggests the human brain, whatever it is, didn't evolve inside just one kind of human. It was an idea trying to happen across different species, across continents, co-evolving alongside memory and fear. And if even Neanderthals showed signs of imagination, what else lurks between the folds of our past, waiting to be unearthed? Fast forward to about 1.8 million years ago. A skull discovered in Demanesi, Georgia, shows a brain only half the size of ours but with teeth worn down not by age, but by use. This person was eating in ways that needed planning, sharing, maybe even compassion. Around this time, early humans started making tools not just to bash or cut but to shape other tools. Fire came next. And with fire came warmth, cooking, and long hours of sitting together after dark. Some scientists believe these cold, flickering nights around the fire may have been the birthplace of storytelling. Think about that stories not as entertainment, but as survival tools, passed from one mind to another. A memory carried not in DNA, but in tale. And every time a child asked, why? The brain stretched just a little further, but the biggest leap was still coming, one that would split time in two and almost tear us apart. Roughly 70,000 years ago, a strange explosion happened, not in the sky or the ground, but in our heads. Anthropologists call it the cognitive revolution. Suddenly, humans began doing things no other species had done. We painted animals we hadn't yet hunted, we imagined spirits we couldn't see. We created myths, gossip, trade even things that don't physically exist, like tribes or gods or nations. All of it came from the brain's new ability to believe in shared fictions. And these shared fictions changed everything. With them, small bands of humans could cooperate in groups of hundreds, even thousands. For the first time, the brain wasn't just responding to the world, it was rewriting it turning thought into power. But this gift came at a cost. Through the same mental leaps that let us build cities, we also began casting out outsiders, waging wars, and defining who Didor didn't belong. Why would an organ engineered for survival start tearing its own species apart? The answer lies in what came next with the rise of power, faith, and empire. By 3000 BCE, in places like Mesopotamia and the Nile Valley, human brains were building pyramids, ziggurats, and written language. But these weren't just architectural or linguistic feats, they were signs of something deeper. The brain had begun organizing time itself. Calendar systems, taxes, divine kingship all inventions to tame chaos. At the heart of it all was memory, externalized, written down, and preserved. Clay tablets replaced oral stories. Bureaucracy replaced instinct. And in doing so, the brain outsourced parts of its own function. As these ancient civilizations grew, so did their understanding of themselves and others. With writing came history. With history, identity. But also, fear. Because if you can write laws, 
You can also write enemies. The mind that once used imagination to paint antelope on cave walls was now drawing borders, writing punishments, building hierarchies. Still, none of that could predict what would happen when the brain turned its focus inward not on the gods, but on itself. In ancient India, around 500 BCE, a physician named Sushruta wrote some of the earliest known texts on brain surgery. Using tools made of stone and bronze, he described procedures that would terrify modern surgeons, including cutting into the skull to ease pain or madness. Meanwhile in Greece, thinkers like Hippocrates began to challenge the idea that emotions came from the heart. He claimed the brain was the seat of intelligence and sensation. But even that was just the beginning. The real turning point came centuries later, when Islamic scholars like Avicenna translated and expanded on Greek knowledge preserving it through the Middle Ages. They mapped out brain injuries, developed metaphors for the mind, and even suggested that trauma could distort thought. Across cultures, the human brain was no longer seen as just tissue. It was becoming the root of the soul, the self, and the strange, electric magic we now call consciousness. But what happens when we finally try to dissect that magic, neuron by neuron? In the 20th century, the dissection began not with knives, but with wires and waves. Scientists like Wilder Penfield used electrodes during brain surgery to trigger memories, smells, even dreams. A single touch to the cortex could unlock a forgotten childhood or make someone hear voices that weren't there. In hidden labs and crowded hospitals, machines lit up human thought in real time. Then, in the 21st century, artificial intelligence entered the scene. Brain-computer interfaces let paralyzed people move robotic limbs by thought alone. Scans revealed how love, fear, and sadness lit up different regions like constellations. And yet, with all our progress, one fact remains. We still don't fully understand how our own minds work. We can map them, model them, even mimic them, but the spark that turns electricity into experience that makes a memory feel like a life, remains out of reach. The brain has hunted itself for centuries, and maybe that's the ultimate twist. The more we learn, the deeper the mystery grows. Today, inside chilled laboratories and billion-dollar startups, the brain meets its newest mirror, artificial intelligence. Algorithms trained on oceans of data now finish our sentences, mimic our voices, and predict what we'll do next. Some can even generate images from pure imagination, much like ours once did on cave walls. But the irony is sharp AI doesn't feel love, grief, awe. It doesn't dream, not yet. As we edge closer to recreating the brain's functions in silicon, the question isn't just what the brain is. It's what makes it human. Is it emotion, story, suffering? Despite centuries of searching, the core of our consciousness still slips through the net like a whisper you can almost catch. Every neuron we map, every connection we trace, only seems to remind us how far we still are from the truth. The brain, it turns out, may be the only thing in the universe attempting to understand itself. And that may be the greatest story ever told. So here we are, standing at the edge of a mirror, staring into the workings of our own mind. From ancient pigments on bone to digital neurons flickering in machines, the journey of the human brain is not just a tale of evolution, but of longing. Longing to know, to feel, to mean something. We are born asking questions, and the brain, in its endless loops of memory and mystery, keeps offering more. It made gods to explain storms, built empires to chase order, and now builds machines to reflect itself. Yet for all our brilliance, we remain haunted by the same question we started with in that Anatolian cave. Why? The answer may never arrive in full. But maybe that's the point not to solve the brain entirely, but to be changed by the pursuit, to wonder, to dream, and to keep exploring the vast, unfinished story written behind our eyes.